my business, um, but your business, uh, advertising. <laughs> and uh, yes, the lecture you're about to hear is every bit as provocative as the title. Uh, welcome to the 2014 ITV Spotlight Lecture. And we're delighted to have with us, um, all the way from San Francisco, Mr. Bob Hoffman. Uh, in short, he believes uh, you are blind to the basic truths uh, when it comes to online and social media. Um, he thinks that the industry is deluded. Uh, we've had the God delusion, now we have the ad delusion, uh, or the ad contrarian, should I say. That's the name of his blog uh, and his book. Uh, he was a founder and CEO of uh, agencies including Hoffman Lewis, uh, one of the largest on the West Coast. He's created advertising for McDonald's, Toyota, Shell, Nestle, Chevrolet, Bank of America, AT&T, and uh, many more. As I say, he's provocative, he is stimulating, but is he right? Uh, you decide. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Hoffman. Thank you, boys and girls. Um, Thanks for coming. Hi, everybody. My name is Bob. I'm here to talk about bullshit. <laughs> uh, you're probably thinking, what kind of schmuck go, comes all the way from San Francisco to London to talk about bullshit? <laughs> well, now you know. <laughs> Actually, I think it's an important subject. Uh, I think bullshit is doing us a lot of harm. <laughs> it's damaging our civic life. It's hurting our businesses, and it's harming our relationships, and it's annoying the hell out of me. Bullshit is different from lying. Lying is willful. When you lie, you know what the truth is, but you intentionally misrepresent it. In a way, bullshit is more insidious, because people who bullshit often don't know what the truth is and don't care. They're out to make a point, they're out to sell you an idea, and they really don't care whether what they are saying is true or not. The discouraging part is that bullshit has become such a powerful weapon that it's hard for us to stop ourselves from using it. We use it on consumers, we use it on our clients, and we are now bullshitting ourselves. In fact, we're so drunk on this stuff, we're starting to believe our own bullshit. There are people in our business who believe that consumers are in love with brands. They believe consumers want to have relationships with brands. They want to have brand experiences and be personally engaged with brands. These people actually believe this. You go to their Twitter profiles, I'm passionate about brands. You're what? Dude, get a fucking girlfriend. <laughs> there are people in our business who believe that consumers are going on Facebook and Twitter and having conversations with each other about brands. All you have to do is go to your Facebook page and if you can read, you can see that people are having conversations about everything in the universe except brands. And yet, the bullshit we tell ourselves is apparently so powerful that it supersedes the evidence of our own eyes. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. I have three modest objectives for today's talk. First is to contradict pretty much of everything I expect you've heard or are going to hear this week. Se second is to annoy people. Um, aside from crossword puzzles, annoying people is really the only thing I'm good at. And third is to have you leave this talk a little less comfortable and a little more skeptical than when you arrived. Most of what I'm talking about relates to the US because honestly, I have no idea what goes on here. However, I would be very surprised if it's much different from what goes on in the US. The thesis of my talk is that an astounding amount 
of what the experts and pundits and geniuses have told us about advertising and marketing and media in the past 10 years has turned out to be baloney. Yes, there have been amazing changes in technology and in media and in communication. And these changes were supposed to augur radical changes in consumer behavior. But as far as I can tell, they have resulted in small to moderate changes at most. And yet the experts who sold us on these fairy tales are just as certain in their prognostications, just as overbearing in their pronouncements, and just as sneaky in their data as ever. Before I began in advertising, I was a science teacher. There were only two problems with that. One, I didn't know anything about science. And two, I don't like children very much. <laughs> I later went on to spend one year as the special assistant to the executive director of the California Academy of Sciences. One of the things that being around science and scientists taught me was a healthy respect for the scientific method. Scientists go through years of experimentation and peer review and skeptical analysis and torture before an idea of theirs is accepted. After years of scrutiny and agony, if their results hold up, they can say they actually know something. Knowing something, it turns out, is completely different from thinking you know something. So then I got into advertising as a copywriter. And the first thing that struck me was, we didn't really seem to know anything. We thought we knew a lot of things. We had ideas about consumer behavior and what made good advertising. We had all these rules and principles and philosophies, but I couldn't find any facts. All I could find were assertions and opinions masquerading as facts. We did things that looked and sounded like science. We used the language and the tools of science. We had questionnaires and computer programs and clipboards and lab coats, but we didn't use the scientific method. We rarely, if ever, used controls for our research. We didn't repeat our studies to verify them. We didn't have peer review of our methods or our conclusions and no one ever replicated our studies to validate them. Now, I'm not here to pick on market researchers. Our willingness, our unwillingness to, uh, to be diligent and to care about what we're doing isn't their fault. But the result is that we don't really know what we think we know. So over time, I developed an annoying habit. I stopped believing advertising experts. I don't care what university they went to, or what credentials they have, or what awards they've won, or how many tattoos they have. <laughs> if they don't have the facts and they can't explain them to me simply and clearly, I'm skeptical. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman said it best. Science, he said, is the belief in the ignorance of experts. One of the problems with our advertising experts is that they have a free pass. They go around to conferences, they talk to the press, they write stupid blogs, <laughs> um, and they make profound statements and confident statements about our industry, and no one ever goes back and checks up on them. Well, today, amigos, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to compare what our experts have told us over the past 10 years with the facts. It's going to be fun. We begin our little journey in 2004, about 10 years ago. If you recall, pundits started to declare that advertising was dying or dead. One of America's most respected research firms, Forrester and Company, proclaimed we had reached, quote, the end of the era of mass marketing. Apparently, they forgot to tell Apple, who sold 200 million iTunes downloads that year and set the stage for the most mind-blowing explosion of mass marketing in history. Soon thereafter, Seth Godin, the best-selling guru of marketing, said, quote, we have reached the end of traditional advertising. He apparently forgot to tell Toyota and Coke and McDonald's. 
Then Advertising Age, the top advertising trade publication in the States, said, quote, the post-advertising age is underway. Bob Garfield, a columnist at Advertising Age, said in 2009, quote, the present is apocalyptic. Any hope for a seamless transition or any transition at all from mass media and marketing to micromedia and marketing are absurd. The sky is falling. We are exquisitely, irretrievably fucked. <laughs> Bob, Bob is a nice guy, but I really think he needs a hug. <laughs> and according to the nonprofit think tank Future Lab, they just came right out and said it, quote, advertising is dead. So here's my dilemma. I'm confused. Everywhere I look, I see advertising. It's on every shopping bag, every T-shirt, every urinal, every petrol pump, every bus, every napkin, every coaster, grocery receipt, milk carton, boarding pass, theater ticket, and dry cleaning bag. Every square inch of the fucking planet is covered in advertising, <laughs> and these schmucks are telling us it's dead. <laughs> Forbes magazine says, between now and 2017, the US TV advertising sector will grow at a compounded annual rate approaching 10%. According to eMarketer, digital advertising in the US grew 15% last year. Advertising is dead? If our economies would grow at half that rate, we'd be dancing in the streets. I'm sorry, you simply cannot kill advertising. On the final day, when that big flaming asteroid bears down on our poor little planet, and all is destroyed, there'll be only two things left, cockroaches and copywriters. <laughs> By the way, the cockroaches will be the clients. <laughs> Did you just say they already are? Is that... <laughs> That's not nice. Um, <clears throat> OK, next we were told that the DVR, do you guys call it a DVR, digital video recorder, or PVR, personal, whatever you? I'm going to call it a DVR because that's what we call it over in the place I live. Um, we were told that the DVR was going to totally disrupt the TV industry. Remember that? TiVo introduced the first mar mass market DVR in the US in 1998, over 15 years ago. Everyone was going to record the shows they liked, watch them at their leisure, and buzz through the ads. It sounded so obvious and so logical. In 2006, IBM released a report including predictions about the DVR called, quote, the end of television as we know it. In 2008, TiVo's CEO said, quote, probably two-thirds or more of the households advertisers care about reaching will be fast-forwarding through television ads. Bullshit. In the third quarter of last year, Nielsen reported that 8% of total TV viewing in the US was done on a DVR. About half the time, people using a DVR skip the spots, which means 4% of total spots were missed. If I remember my fractions correctly, 4% is not 2 thirds. Meanwhile, in the 15 years since the DVR was introduced, TV viewership has grown over 20%. So the, so the positive effect of more TV viewing is at least five times the negative effect of the DVR. And the strange thing is there is no negative effect. Not only has the DVR not disrupted TV viewing, it has actually enhanced it. An article in the LA Times was headlined, quote, analysis, DVR viewing gives fall TV shows a critical ratings boost. And the lead line stated, quote, TV executives used to look at DVRs as assassins that could kill their business. But this fall, the recording devices are seen as saviors. Now, if the DVR wasn't going to kill TV, then the web was. You see, TV and the web were going to converge. You remember convergence, right? Uh, and the web was going to provide us with all the fun of TV without the annoying advertising. Let's listen to the experts on this in an article entitled, Let's Just Declare TV Dead and Move On, TechCrunch wrote, quote, the writing is on the wall. At the end of the day, people want to consume content. I hate that fucking word, content. 
People want to consume content without the friction of having to sit down in front of a television at an appointed time. People want to see the whole show on YouTube. There is a fundamental shift in consumer behavior going on. They wrote that in 2006. From Wired Magazine, quote, traditional TV won't be here, won't be here in seven to 10 years. That was written in 2007. From The Telegraph in 2007, TV is dying, says Google expert. Also from that year, in an article entitled, Internet Will Revolutionize Television, Fox News wrote, the Internet is set to revolutionize television within five years. They quoted a fellow you may have heard of named Bill Gates, saying, quote, I'm stunned how people aren't seeing that in five years, people will laugh at what we had. That was seven years ago. Anyone here laughing about that? I don't hear anything. Now let's look at the facts. Despite the bullshit of all these experts, in the third quarter of 2013, 97% of all video viewing in the US was done on a television. 3% was done online. It turns out that contrary to the hot air of our media thought leaders, people actually like TV. Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> they like looking at Mark. He's handsome and popular. What is that like? It must be so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Another of the fairy tales of the advertising industry was that interactivity was going to make advertising more engaging and effective. Interactive advertising was once again going to disrupt the old forms of advertising and make them obsolete. Unfortunately for us ad hacks, however, it turns out that people have no interest whatsoever in interacting with advertising. In fact, online banner ads have a click-through rate lower than one in a thousand. This is not interactivity. This is absence of interactivity. The idea that the same consumer who was frantically clicking her TV remote to escape from ads was going to joyfully click her mouse to interact with them is going to go down as one of the all-time great advertising delusions. What's worse, an alarming amount of interaction with online advertising is apparently fraudulent. According to a report by CNET, only 38% of traffic on the web now is human. 62% is bots, scrapers, hackers, spammers, and other impersonators. And the amount of fraud being perpetrated on advertisers by online scammers is crazy. A recent study reported in the Wall Street Journal found that 54% of display ads paid for by advertisers between May 2012 and February 13, never appeared in front of a live human being, 54%. If the journal was correct and the study projectable, it means that of the $14 billion spent on banner advertising last year in the US, 7.5 billion probably constituted some degree of deception or fraud. And according to Adweek magazine, this could reach 9.5 billion this year in the US alone. <sighs> Getting excited here. Okay. <laughs> Next, of course, we have social media marketing. Now, social media itself has been a huge worldwide phenomenon. There is no question about that. But social media marketing has been anything but. We were told that social media marketing was going to, dare I invoke the holy word one last time, disrupt traditional paid advertising. We've all read a thousand articles about the power of social media marketing. Let me just quote a few. According to the, new, to the newspaper USA Today, quote, social media is the lone currency that virtually guarantees a result. One of America's great geniuses from Sequoia Capital had this to say, if you can harness social media marketing, you don't have to pay for advertising anymore. And according to an article from entrepreneur.com entitled, Is the End Near for Traditional Advertising? 
Facebook's global brand experience manager believes that companies need to replace random display ads. Those ads will fall by the wayside like so many other obsolete processes and technologies. I want you to remember that for a minute because as we'll soon see, Facebook has pulled off one of the most awesome bait and switch moves of all time. We'll get to that in a minute. The theory that people want to engage with brands online and share their enthusiasms with their friends and that their friends will share their enthusiasms with other friends through social media channels has turned out to be an infantile fantasy. Take another look at your Facebook page. Go there when we're done here. Don't do it now. When we're done here, go to your Facebook page. It's swimming in traditional paid ads. Count the number of paid ads and compare it to the number of conversations about brands. In fact, what social media sites are rapidly becoming is just one more channel for traditional paid advertising. Most brands are realizing that their social media programs are way more time consuming, way more expensive, and way less capable of driving sales than was promised. The first crack in the wall came in 2010 when Pepsi canceled all its TV advertising and its Super Bowl advertising to great fanfare and bet big on what I believe was the largest experiment in social media marketing excuse me, ever attempted, the Pepsi Refresh Project. Time Magazine quoted the CEO of a New York brand consultancy, quote, this is exactly where Pepsi needs to be. These days, brands need to become a movement. Well, they became a movement, all right. <laughs> I estimate the, the Refresh Project cost them between 50 and $100 million. It got them 3.5 million Facebook likes and a 5% loss in market share, which they seem to have never recovered. That year, they dropped from the second best-selling soft drink in the U.S. to third. Pepsi's marketing director said, quote, the success has been overwhelming. We have more than doubled our Facebook fans. We have more than 24,000 Twitter fans. The LA Times didn't seem to agree. They called it, quote, a stunning fall from grace. Then in September 2012, our friends at Forrester Research perhaps having had a few years to reconsider their previously immoderate statements, reported, quote, social media tactics are not meaningful sales drivers. The truth is that social is a barely negligible source of sales. I wonder what's worse than barely negligible. Strongly ne negligible? <laughs> a few months later, a story in the Wall Street Journal reported on a study IBM had done on the effect of social media. The journal commented, quote, there's one notable underperformer in the online shopping frenzy, social media. But perhaps the most stunning report was issued just a few weeks ago by McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm. This one sentence from their report sums it up, quote, email remains a more effective way to acquire customers than social media, nearly 40 times that of Facebook and Twitter combined. Finally, even Facebook, the face of social media, where the tired old ways of traditional advertising were coming face to face with the brave new world of the social consumer, seems to have given up on the fantasy of social media marketing. Just last week, Time Magazine reported that Facebook's pages platform reaches only 6% of a brand's followers, and it's headed down to 1% to 2%. In a statement that's absolutely mind-blowing, Here's what a Facebook spokesperson had to say regarding social media marketing to Time Magazine. Quote, if businesses want to make sure that people see their content, the best strategy is, and always has been, paid advertising from Facebook. Now, I am often called a Luddite dinosaur by social media maniacs. They say I'm just an old traditional ad guy who totally doesn't get social media. I love when they say this, because then I could stick it right up their vulnerable places. I, 
I tell them I have accomplished more with social media than most of them ever will or ever have. I've actually created that rarest of things using social media, a successful brand. It's called The Ed Contrarian. It's helped me achieve a number one selling book, a blog that has been named one of the world's most influential and has gotten me invited to nice places like this to speak to nice people like you. And I did it all through social media. Meanwhile, the only thing most of our social media experts have created is a PowerPoint presentation. When I talk about the bullshit of social media marketing, I'm not speaking as a social media denier. I'm speaking as one of its success stories. I know how hard it is. I know how much work and effort it's taken me. I've done this for seven years, every day and every night. And I also know that most of the social media miracle workers and the corporations who dabble in social media have no idea what they're doing. You think your company is the only one whose social media program isn't worth a damn? I have news for you. You've got plenty of company. Every man, woman, child, organization, business, and interest group now has a social media program. There are zillions of them, and a tiny, tiny fraction have made a difference. Here's what you need to know about social media. The hundreds of millions of people using social media are interested in interacting with each other. Not brands, not ads, not you, not me. So how has our industry reacted to the weak performance of social media marketing? Just like we always do. We created a mountain of false goals. Likes, followers, plus ones, uploads, downloads, links, bookmarks, forwarding, following, referring, clicking, friending, everything except the one thing we're supposed to be doing, selling. Now, before someone claims that I said there's no place for online advertising or social media in the world, let me state the obvious. Of course there is. But what there is no place for is the bullshit that has been associated with it. Finally, there's one more thing I want to talk about, the traditional advertising business. Let's not forget where all this bullshit started. <laughs> in the traditional ad business, we're always reminding our clients that consumer behavior is not rational. We lecture them on the importance of emotion as a factor in buying decisions and in brand preferences. We explain to them that an ad is not a court case in which the best argument wins. And yet, while we are exquisitely sensitive to the Ill illogical nature of consumer behavior, we're completely oblivious to the illogical nature of our own behavior. My favorite example is the way we ignore people over 50. In the US, people over 50 control 70% of the wealth. They are responsible for almost 50% of consumer spending. They buy 55% of all consumer packaged goods and 62% of all new cars. In fact, <clears throat> if Americans over 50 were a country by themselves, they would be the thir third largest economy in the world after the US and China. Americans over 50 wield more economic power than Germany, Japan, or Sir Martin Sorrell. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, they are the target for only 5% of all US advertising. 5%. Why does this foolishness exist? Because of bullshit. You see, advertising and marketing people don't like being associated with old people. We like the excitement of youth, not the boredom of middle age, not the frailties of old age. We can't build ourselves a hot advertising career by talking to old farts. Consequently, we've invented all kinds of baloney for why we ignore them. For example, we say they're dying out. In fact, adults over 50 are growing at almost three times the rate of adults under 50. We say they're stuck in their ways and they won't change brands. The truth is, baby boomers are just as likely to change brands as younger adults. We say they want to be like young people. Nonsense. They want to be youthful, but they do not want to be like young people. This is a distinction that's completely lost on our industry. We say they are downsizing. More bullshit. Between 1999 and 2009, spending among baby boomers in the US grew by 45%. 
One of the great problems of our industry is how oblivious we are to our own prejudices and our own illogical behaviors. We seem to be able to recognize it in everyone but ourselves. Okay, I'm getting close to the end. I want to read to you a quote from a guy named John Lovett. Lovett is a smart person who spent three years as the head speechwriter for Hillary Clinton and went on to become a speechwriter for President Barack Obama. Lovett gave a speech recently. Here's what he said, quote, one of the greatest threats we face is simply put bullshit. We're drowning in it. We're drowning in rhetoric that is just true enough not to be a lie in industry-sponsored research, in social media's imitation of human connection, in legalese and corporate doublespeak. It infects every facet of public life, corrupting our discourse, wrecking our trust in major institutions, and lowering our standards for the truth. I'm afraid Mr. Lovett is right. We have a problem. It's particularly striking in our industry, where everyone seems to know the fairy tales and no one seems to know the facts. Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences, says, quote, people don't believe facts. They believe experts. So what are we going to do? Well, for my part, I'm writing a book. It's going to be called Advertising Needs Troublemakers. Is it going to make a difference? I doubt it. But that's not the point. The point is, we have a responsibility to the truth. Our industry needs it, and our clients deserve it. We have developed a terrible habit of telling half the truth half the time. We speak in dreadful jargon that obscures what it pretends to clarify. We've also become too congenial, too respectable, and too polite. We're in desperate need of troublemakers. We need shit disturbers. We need hell raisers. We need the kind of quarrelsome, pugnacious, opinionated people that make the arts vibrant and interesting, even if they're crazy, even if they're wrong, even if they're obnoxious. <laughs> they keep us honest and keep us on our toes. Attending an advertising conference these days is like going to an insurance seminar. <laughs> It's full of bland, jargon monkeys who just repeat the overcooked cliches of the same experts we see at every conference. We need people who aren't afraid to get up on stage at the next big data or social media conclave and pull their pants down. <laughs> we need people who aren't afraid to break a cliche or two over a pundit's head. Do yourself a favor. Stop listening to big mouths like me. Nobody is smarter than the truth. Take the time to find out the facts for yourself. Draw your own conclusions. Allow yourself the wonderful freedom of skepticism. Are things changing? Of course they are. Things are always changing. But that's no excuse for a whole industry that's supposed to be creative and forward-thinking to sit back and operate on unreliable and irresponsible assertions that are hyped promoted, and ballyhooed <clears throat> by people who have been wrong over and over. We have been subjected to 10 years of insufferable bullshit, and I, for one, am tired of it. Thank you very much. much, Bob. I'm sure you thought that was very entertaining. Um, I told you it would be provocative. Um, I can see everybody thinking, you're right, Luddite dinosaur, <laughs> uh, a man from a previous age. Um, are you actually saying that big brands should never use online or no. social media? A total waste of time? No, of course not. Um, there is a use for it. And, uh, boy, let me get into a little advertising theory, if I might, okay? Um, <clears throat> Before, let's go back before online advertising to the traditional advertising where we had radio and television and we had magazines and newspapers. And the idea was that we used those to advertise to create demand. That was the objective. We were creating demand. Along, uh, along with that, we had a, a funny little cousin of advertising called the Yellow Pages. Do you guys have the Yellow Pages here? Okay. 
And the Yellow Pages was different. The Yellow Pages was about fulfilling demand. When you knew you wanted a pizza for dinner, you went to the Yellow Pages and you found out where to get the pizza and you called it. Here comes the web, and uh, we all assume, because we all dra draw straight lines, that the web is going to be like radio, television, magazines. It's going to be good for creating demand. Well, it's been my observation that it has not been good for creating demand. And if you, wanted to prove, you want to prove that to yourself, go to your local supermarket and walk down the aisles and see what brands in the supermarket have been created by online advertising. And you'll find it's somewhere between almost none and none. There are no brands of peanut butter, no brands of soft drink or beer, no brands of toothpaste, no brands of soap, no brands of detergent that have been created by online advertising. However, what digital advertising has been terrific at is not the creating demand side, but the fulfilling demand side. When you know you want to go to London, where do you go? You go to the web to find out what the best airline rates are, what the good hotels to stay at are. So we have to think about how to use these different kinds of advertising channels in the best way possible. Now, I'm doing vast generalizations here because every brand is different and every product is different, but in general, I think television, radio, other traditional advertising forms have proven thus far to be way better at creating demand. And the web has been excellent, way better than the Yellow Pages was, at fulfilling demand. And that's how I think, at this point at least, how it's going to be used. What's going to happen in the future? I have no idea. I never predict the future. I just, yeah. But it is changing, and it is changing fast. I mean, in terms of consuming news, for instance, um, it used to be, I think, 93% television, uh, newspapers or radio, and like, te this is five years ago, it was 10%, you know, online or whatever. Now it's 26% online, 70-odd right. percent. Um, other, it, so it is changing. What, what makes you so sure that everyone else is deluded and you're not? I'm not sure everyone else is deluded and I'm not. I just... This is, these are my observations. I'm not really out to convince anyone of anything. I don't own a TV station. I don't give a damn where people spend their money. I'm just telling you what my, as, as someone who was in the advertising agency business for 40 years, <clears throat> saw it from both sides. These are, these are my observations. And um, I'm not sure everyone else is deluded. I think they are, but I'm not sure of it. But in the case you said, what we often confuse is the use of digital media with its power as a marketing or advertising entity. The fact that more people are using online for news is not a de facto proof that it's a good advertising medium. For example, let me give you an example of that. The old-fashioned telephone. Everyone in the world had a telephone. It was a hugely popular means of communication. That didn't make it a good advertising medium. It was a lousy advertising medium. The fact that people use it for communication or to get information or to have conversations doesn't necessarily make something a good advertising medium. Uh, right, we've got five minutes left. Who wants to get stuck into Bob? Who, who's got a question? <laughs> Who'd like to put a point to Bob? Oh, come on. Um, yeah, Simon. Um, so Bob, you uh, haven't mentioned any detail of programmatic buying, which is a scientific phase uh, for buying. Uh, I'd love to know your opinion. Uh, I know nothing about that. I am, uh, I'm a copywriter by trade. I'm really not a media expert. My expectation is that programmatic buying is here to stay. I don't like the idea that humans are ceding control to machines. I never like that idea. But I don't think it's going away. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's about all I think and know about it. I'm not, it doesn't interest me, tell you the truth. The, the part of advertising that interests me is the creative part. That's really the, the part that I'm interested in. It's not that I don't love you media people. I do. <laughs> it's just that my interest has always been on the creative side and the strategic side. 
Who else has got a point? Yeah. Hi, you mentioned um, uh, sort of troublemakers. Yes. Um, I just wondered if you had, if there was anyone out there that kind of impress, impressed you at the moment or, you know, people pulling their pants down, et cetera. Uh, no, uh, I, I can't think of any names, but I can think of um, categories of, of things. And the, uh, the people I love, and maybe it's because that's how I grew up, is in independent agencies, uh, independent people. The agency business has gotten terribly conglomeratized and consolidated, and I don't think that's doing the agency business any favors. I know it's doing the shareholders of those companies favors, but I don't think it's doing the employees of the agencies. I don't think it's doing the clients any favors. And so I love independent agencies. I love the people who break away from an agency and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, going to, I'm smarter than the schmuck in the corner office. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, those people, I think, are have always been the future of the advertising but It's always people like that who break away and start something new and, and do great work. And, uh, and it's not to say that there aren't big agencies that do great work, of course there are. But it's a matter of probabilities and likelihoods. And, and the people who break away and do it their way are the ones that I love and that I, you know, I hope there are more of. We need more of them in the agency business, I think. Anybody else? Just hold on, just get, take the mic. Hi. I was in a session here yesterday and it was on um, millennials and brands advertising to target this group of people. And there was a whole bunch of um, fabulous millennial women up there and they said that um, people can, brands can use social to um, talk to, uh, to, to millennials. Um, but they should, rather than advertise to them, kind of create forums. And one girl described it as almost creating like online youth clubs so that brands can talk to them in this way rather than selling to them. Do you kind of agree with that point? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of, I think there are a lot of uh, utopian thoughts about how to reach certain groups. There's no proof, there's no data to prove that any of that's true. It's just talk. It's like uh, people are t always saying, the consumer is in control. That's another one of the mantras of new age uh, thinking. Well, where's the proof? Well, how do you know? It's baloney. Maybe it's not baloney. Maybe it's true, but I don't see it. I, 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 and you look at the data, it's just not there. It's just not there. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, You've talked a lot about people's predictions yes. um, and not being necessarily right. It would be great to get, to get one from you. Um, with the changing channel mix, I think we all agree that that's definitely going to continue. How do you think brands will develop attention and, dare I say it, love in the next 20 years? The same way they always have, by making really good products and really good ads. I don't think that's going to change. I don't, think the, I, I don't think any medium changes that. We, we are so obsessed with delivery, ch with, with delivery systems, with what media you're going to use. We have to get back to ideas. That is what always has built brands, great products and great ideas about those products that can be de delivered in any advertising channel. You know, a good idea is a good idea in any channel. A bad idea is a bad idea in any channel. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, that's it. We've run out of time. But I just, I'm just interested. Who do you think... Uh, there's a quick sort of crude straw poll. Who thinks Bob is right? Wow. I'm not hey, going to bother. Who thinks I'm, I'm bringing you guys to my next talk. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. To you. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Indeed. <laughs> thank you, Bob.